Hello everyone and thank you all for joining us today for our first GMJ workshop of season one. So today we are going to be diving into US tax. So this GMJ workshop is the first in a series of special global mobility events online where we put a GMJ supplier in the question hot seat and take questions from you, the GMJ ambassadors, who I'm sure you all know are HR global mobility professionals and members of GMJ. Um, and we also have questions from HR guests. So to answer your questions today, we are honoured to have some exceptional experts on US tax from Grant Thornton LLP. So thank you to everyone who submitted questions in advance, but there is still time to get questions in. So if you would like to ask a question, please pop that into the chat window and we will try our best to get to your questions. Um, so just if you have noticed a message about this uh, session being recorded, just to reassure you, we're only recording the expert speakers and I for future GMJ videos. So we're not recording anything that delegates, um, uh, anything from delegates videos and audios. So before we get started, I'm going to introduce you to our expert speakers. Um, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. So over to you, Richard Tong and Jay, uh, Josh Jagust, sorry. Um, and I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself and let us know which element of the US tax system you find the most fascinated, fascinating, sorry, and why. Okay, thank you, Heather, and good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Richard Tong, a principal at Grant Thornton. I lead the firm's global mobility services practice in the US. Uh, I've got around 16 and a half years of experience working with companies from large public uh, through to startups, really going international for the first time and spent an awful lot of time over the last few years advising on remote work and all the complexities that have come from the pandemic and the shifts in mobility. And we'll be talking more about that today. Josh. Thanks, Richard. Josh Jagus. I'm a senior manager in our global mobility practice at Grant Thornton. I've been practicing for a little over 13 years now. And like Richard, I, I specialize in helping our clients with uh, all elements of the mobility program from tax, payroll and HR policy, working with all different types of clients up to Fortune 500. So in terms of the question on what do we find uh, the most fascinating, I mean, for me, um, U.S. tax, the fact that you know, citizens, residents are taxed on worldwide income means you've always got two sides of the coin when you're advising. So. Uh, there's always something new. You're always learning. There's always a puzzle or a challenge to get a, a, an answer to. And so I think um, there's a degree of kind of creativity and thoughtfulness that you've got to put into getting to, to an answer. Um, it, it, it's, uh, as I say, in 16 and a half years, you're learning something new all the time. And, and I think that's a, a nuance of U.S. tax and that taxation of uh, residents on, on a worldwide basis that really is the trigger for that. How about you? Uh, my favorite thing, it, it really is similar in the reviewing residency and finding creative ways with the tax treaties to uh, minimize U.S. tax or global tax rate through the network of tax treaties the U.S. has and using those different articles to, to help our clients out. That's what I find enjoyable. Fantastic. Thank you, Josh and Richard. So uh, back to the main reason why we're here. So, of course, which is to answer your questions on U.S. tax in relation to global mobility. So the US tax system, uh, I think probably we all know, um, and you've both just hinted about, uh, provides unique opportunities and challenges for GM programmes. So that's what we're here to talk about today. So we've had over 20 questions asked in advance. Uh, we're hoping we might get a few more in the chat. So we've grouped these together um, so that we can cover as much as we can throughout the session. And I'm going to pass over to Richard and Josh to start answering your questions. So over to you. Thank you, Heather. So just is going to bring up some um, slides now. Again, just to reiterate the focus here um, is to, to walk through the questions that we've been asked. And we've had some really great questions come through. Um, we split these into five different groupings from you know, remote work, digital nomads, et cetera, all the way through to technology compensation and, and program management considerations. Um, we'd really love for more questions to come in as we go. So if there's anything that we touch on that you'd like to hear more about, uh, please do feel free to share. If there's something that we're, we're not talking about that wasn't in the questions that came through before and you'd love to hear about, um, then please do share. So we'll kick things off then just looking at the state of global mobility. Some of you may have seen uh, the graphic that we've got shared up here. Um, 
And, and I think what's important, and I'm sure that you're all familiar with, is just the diversification of mobility from a pre and post pandemic state. And, and what it is that tax, finance, HR, and obviously yourselves as mobility professionals are being asked to address and, and deal with. The seismic shifts that you see in global workforces and how organizations are operating. The pre-pandemic, you know, we've we've distilled it down here into that kind of traditional mobility that you had, the assignments, transfers, project-based, um, th there may be rotations, etc. And then obviously the challenges around business travel. And I think in a lot of organizations, business travel was something that was still a real challenge. There's, there's a number of companies out there that obviously have robust business travel um, policies, tracking and operations around it. But I think certainly when you look at it in the context of the United States, and you've got all the different state tax regimes, as well as having to manage the compliance at a federal level, it really gets very, very complicated. So there's certainly more than enough complexity and um, you know, process needed around what we had in a pre-pandemic um, mobility landscape for organizations to be dealing with. If we flip then to the, the next slide, and this captures kind of where we are now, and I think it really highlights that, as I mentioned before, that diversification of mobility. The first thing you'll see there is the kind of COVID impacted situations that distributed workforce. I think it's fair to say that on the on the main part, those situations of employees getting stuck overseas, choosing to work uh, in another country and then kind of choosing to stay longer, uh, whether they were supposed to and allowed to or not. The majority of those, I think, have worked their way through, though, obviously, you know, we are still uh, encountering some instances where, you know, folks are overseas and they want to make it permanent. So it's really... Um, then on the five kind of buckets that we have there, the remote working, the kind of more hybrid arrangements, some of the outsourced resourcing, we certainly see the big escalation and uh, increase in that. Um, in addition, of course, to the continuing traditional mobility and business travel. Um, I, I wanted just to touch on a couple of those as we go into the conversations today. Um, you know, one of the big areas that we're seeing an awful lot of around digital nomads and this idea of, of work from nowhere, I think is garnering an awful lot of attention, both from employees um, as well as from employers. The potential that some of these digital nomad uh, visa arrangements allow for employees to move internationally to have more flexibility around where they work. But without necessarily bringing some of the tax obligations and complexities that you may otherwise um, find uh, for employees who are just choosing to work remotely where one of these arrangements doesn't exist. I mean, that's also to say that, you know, not all digital nomad programs are made the same. And so a lot of them, in fact, do have complexity around them in that they allow for an individual to work from a country, but they don't necessarily take away or mitigate the uh, liability that an individual may have to income tax and social security, in turn, nor so the employer obligations that can arise uh, for the company in a in foreign jurisdiction. And again, saying from a corporate tax level, you know, if you've got an individual working overseas, what might it mean there? So again, an awful lot of interest around this, certainly a lot of press, I would say, kind of talking about some of the limitations of digital nomads at the moment and um, and the fact that tax can be a stumbling block to efficacy around using those more broadly. Uh, work from anywhere, flexible working, we've obviously seen a huge amount around that over the past six to 12 months. Um, and I think what's been interesting is that there's been a real flux in terms of how a lot of organizations have approached this. You know, assumptions have kind of returned to the office that have been dashed. Uh, and again, that can be industry specific. We've seen in financial services, um, you know, a lot more organizations return on a more full-time basis to the office. Um, not so the case in other industries. And so, again, those that were hoping to return in some cases are now looking at, well, how do we codify flexible working arrangements, working remotely, et cetera. The outsourced resourcing, again, I think we found that in terms of markets have shifted. What it is that our, um, the companies need in terms of staff and you know uh, headcount and that overarching cost of an of a workforce, that shifted too. 
So, you know, the, the use of in the independent contractors has increased. You know, we've seen an in, interesting kind of flip-flop in the UK uh, very recently, the mini budget that um, we don't need to go into detail on. I think we all uh, know what happened there. Obviously, with the mini budget, the, the government announced that they were going to get rid of the UK's IR35 legislation that, in effect, would... Uh, put the obligation around independent contractors, employer versus, uh, sorry, employee versus contractor status on the engaging company. That's now been brought back. So that won't be going away. And again, I think it's an area for a lot of, co- for a lot of countries looking at these arrangements. So if you are engaging a lot of people in country as independent contractors, absolutely, there is a huge amount of benefit to a company and having the flexibility and a pool of talent that you don't necessarily need to have um, as an ongoing overhead. But at the same time, are they really independent contractors or might they be employees? And the last two there, the, the, the professional employment organization, the employer of record, again, a lot of interest in those. You know, can, we, can companies use uh, a third party to employ individuals in jurisdictions where they don't have an entity? Can somebody outsource um, and take on that burden of being an employer in, an, in a foreign country. And again, we'll talk about that in a bit more detail, that they provide huge administrative benefit. From a tax perspective, um, there can be challenges around the corporate side of things. You know, do they hold up to scrutiny from the perspective of creating corporate tax exposure uh, by having people in the country, even though they're not employed um, necessarily by the engaging company? And again, how do you treat those individuals if they're not technically your employees, how do you award equity, et cetera? So there's an awful lot of complexity out there. And uh, and again, I think it's fair to say that on a company to company basis, what this looks like will differ quite significantly. It's unique to everybody. Coming out of the pandemic too, we don't have the um we don't have the 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 the, the benefit of having done this before. And so again, a lot of complexity there for uh, for companies in terms of well, how do we how do we manage this? All right. So if we shift then to the next slide, quick one there in terms of a number of the things that I talked about. The business environment shifted. We're interested in the taxation side of things, and again, I think that's where you know everybody uh, is working in a bit of a muddy, unclear kind of situation. Uh, the OECD, as many of you will be aware has indicated that this is something they're going to look at. But obviously, what the OECD does isn't necessarily binding. Um, and so it may be that there's an indicative guidance as to, uh, you know, how comp- how countries should uh, um, approach remote working arrangements um, to mitigate some of the complexities that can arise. IRS has been pretty much silent on this and uh, no indications that anything is forthcoming, at least from discussions that I've had. And so the last piece then as well is that the enforcement and audit environment. We have seen, again, the UK sent notices out to employers around some of the reporting under the short-term business visitor agreement. We saw countries like New Zealand, Israel early on ask uh, individuals who got into the country during the pandemic to file tax returns. But it's not clear, you know, as things have shifted, that incremental move from people being stuck to people choosing to stay longer once they could move during the pandemic to these more fully fledged working remote or hybrid arrangements. How are um, tax authorities going to enforce the rules? Uh, How are they going to approach audit? So there's also a wait and see. So companies are being asked to do something very different with their workforce, but doing it in the context of um, tax law and international rules that really haven't shifted at all this year. So if we go to the next slide, Again, well, why does all of this matter? And in, in the context of mobility, you know, the starting point is if you've got folks working internationally, if you are a U.S. employer um, or an international employer with folks working overseas, do those people give rise to a corporate taxable presence? Could they drag the company into um, in, into a tax regime so they have to file uh, tax returns, that they have to uh, attribute profits, that they have to pay taxes, uh, register with the authorities there. Um, under the double tax treaties, we refer to that as a permanent establishment, a little bit on the next slide around that. Um, but it's a big, big risk. And you know, I think it's fair to say that in a pre-pandemic world, 
when empl a lot of employees, you know, if they ask to work internationally, this would be at the forefront of the considerations. And at the forefront of the considerations that often led to a, no, you can't work remotely because it was an unacceptable level of risk. So again, our companies now are looking at, oh, how do we do this? Um, how do we manage that exposure? In turn, the employer obligations, uh, if you've got a PE or similarly, if an individual is liable to tax, then there may be the requirement to, re to register for payroll. There may be exposure to social security. Within the EU, perhaps um, a little bit easier where there are harmonized rules, but certainly not so in um, most countries where the number of bilateral social security agreements relative to the number of bilateral income tax treaties is significantly different. There are a lot fewer. And so again, there's financial exposure to the company, uh, a lot of complexity in administration if an individual working remotely, working in another country triggers uh, obligations to the employer. And the last piece then is obviously the individual. Um, you know, we, we get asked quite a bit around, well, you know, whose responsibility is this? You know, if somebody goes to work internationally, that's their problem. Um, well, obviously, the corporate tax, the employer obligations say otherwise. Um, but there is obviously that risk that individuals go overseas. Um, they are subject to tax. It creates a lot of complexity for them personally. So, again, in engaging in having a, a global workforce that is globalized in a different way, with different modes of mobility than perhaps in the past, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of consideration there around what are your employees getting into. So we flip then to the next slide just quickly here. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail on this because I suspect that, you know, this is not a tax uh, seminar as such, but just some of the rules that exist out there. Again, you can see this, the top one, uh, some of the rules around creating a permanent establishment. Does, do you have a fixed place of business that you're operating through when people are working overseas? You know, if they're doing that in a country where you don't have a presence, are they in a rented workspace that could be attributed to the business? Um, again, you'll see further down there, are they acting on your behalf? Are they habitually exercising authority to conclude a contract? That has shifted somewhat as well um, towards, um, are they involved in the local market, generating business, et cetera? So again, you know, the, the risk for companies is less clear cut than perhaps it was a few years ago. And again, individuals working remotely can create some risk. Underneath that, most of you I'm expecting are very familiar with the treaty article that says that people can work overseas for 183 days in a um, certain 12 month period. And if the other couple of considerations are met, then they may not be subject to tax in the country they're in. That can provide a lot of flexibility around can people work remotely uh, or not. The one on the right hand side, the technical and economic cooperation, that applies more so to not for profits um, through USAID funded um, projects in other countries where these agreements um, exist, where the individual may not be subject to tax. So there's a number of agreements that, at least from a um, tax perspective, have the ability to mitigate taxes people are working overseas. Obviously, these are well established in the context of traditional mobility and business travel. They're now being tested in a new environment with those new modes of mobility. And, and that's really part of the challenge that we'll be talking through today. All right, so we'll pause there on the, the kind of the landscape. Josh is going to do a quick crash course in US tax um, and obviously how some of this ties in then to the questions that, that you asked. Thanks, Richard. So uh, I'm going to keep this as brief as we can on US taxation for individuals. Uh, really, it starts with making a residency determination. And once individuals become a resident of the US, they're taxed on their worldwide income. Well, there's really two or three ways that an individual can be considered a tax resident for U.S. tax purposes. The first is to be a citizen of the U.S. Um, the next one would be a green card holder or permanent resident of the U.S. And then the third way is if you meet the substantial presence test where you're counting all of your days in the current year, a third of the days in the prior year, and six of the days in the two years prior. And if, those, if that total reaches 183 days or more, you're considered a tax resident of the U.S. In all three of those scenarios, a tax resident is taxed on their worldwide income, regardless of where it's earned. So as you can see, what we are referring to at the beginning and what Richard was just going through with some of his comments, 
if you have a citizen or a permanent resident green card holder, they're considered residents for tax purposes of the U.S., regardless of the days that they spend in the U.S., meaning if you have a citizen working abroad in a European country or an Asia Pacific country, permanent resident um, working somewhere else, they're still going to be tax liable to the U.S., regardless of if actually if any of their income is located and earned in the U.S. So that's when you get into the issues of double taxation and, and how do you relieve those people from double taxation, which I, I will touch on in a minute. Uh, let, let's for a second focus on people coming into the U.S. And that's where, you know, if they're not a citizen or permanent resident, the substantial presence test comes into play. Uh, when you think about people coming in, they meet the residency requirements in the U.S. Oftentimes that will mean in their originating country, they'll cease their residency from a tax perspective there and become non-resident. So that makes that tax um, answer a, a tiny bit easier because now you're focused on really one resident country instead of two, where most of that tax liability would be generating from their physical work location, which in this case would be the US. On the flip side, when you have the outbounds, what I was just mentioning, citizens and permanent residents leaving the US working somewhere, somewhere else, they're gonna be taxable in both the US and that country where they're primarily earning the income. Now the US has a few different ways to rectify some of the double taxation issues. The first being what we call the foreign income exclusion, where there are two modes of, to qualify for that. One is if you're considered a bona fide resident of that foreign country for an entire calendar year, meaning that you've established tax residency in that country for an entire calendar year. And in most cases, you know, if you are looking at the first year of arrival, it's going to be hard to meet that for the entire calendar year, which you have to look at the second year for that. The second one would be the physical presence test, where you're outside of the U.S. for 330 days out of a 365-day period, beginning or ending in the, in the calendar year in that tax year. If you qualify for either the physical presence test or the bona fide residence test, then there's an exclusion of income directly from your taxable income. And it, it changes every year with inflation, but um, the last few years it's been about 110, 115,000 per year. The second mode that you can relieve double taxation is, is something called the foreign tax credit, where the U.S. will allow a dollar for dollar credit against U.S. taxes for income that is earned and taxed outside of the U.S. So in that case, you're, you're paying tax to a foreign country. The U.S. is also taxing that income. It's earned in that foreign country because the individual had, was physically present there, then there's a credit applied for that. Now, the, the difficulties there is if you're dealing with uh, differential tax uh, rates where the U.S. goes up to 37 and some countries are higher and some are lower, if you have a country that has a higher tax than the U.S., you're losing out on some of that credit and you're increasing the individual's global tax rate. If you have an individual that's taxed at a lower tax percentage, they're going to get a credit up to that amount and then anything additional over and above the, the tax rate that they're paying in that new jurisdiction will be taxed in the U.S. So if you have an individual in Singapore taxed at 20 percent and their U.S. tax rate is 37, they're paying 20 percent to Singapore and then 17 percent to the U.S. So you're still held liable for that ultimately U.S. tax rate. Now, the one interesting consideration is we've um, only discussed the U.S. and all the states will have various definitions of residence and how they're taxing income and if they allow for the foreign earned income exclusion or a foreign tax credit and that could obviously increase the the tax liability the global tax liability when we consider states as not all of them will allow the exclusion very few of them allow a foreign tax credit and even a, a smaller amount would um, not follow tax treaties that we you know had discussed previously so that leads us kind of into our, our question here from the before the, the session started. What are the tax implications or changes when an individual status changes to a permanent resident? I've kind of touched on that a little bit, um, where the individual, if they're a green card holder, a permanent resident, are now taxable on their worldwide income, regardless of where it's earned by virtue of being a permanent resident of the U.S. And we've kind of talked about some of those complex or double tax treaty situation, double tax situations already and what that does for the foreign tax credit and the foreign income exclusion. Some countries will have a, a different interpretation of residents and when they're taxable. So there may be some instances where double taxation truly does happen. You know, for instance, China 
um, may have a, a different definition of where the income is earned and who's got the first right to tax it, which could cause some issues of double taxation, even if the individual is working in the U.S. and is resident in both countries. Um, so really, then what does it mean for you all as employers? Well, you've got to pick to factor in the payroll considerations. So there could be some issues for citizens versus non-citizens. Citizens may be el eligible to have a payroll reduction based on the former in income exclusion by virtue of the Form 673, where they're establishing that they're a resident of a new country and able to you know, have an exemption of withholding. Or permanent residents, that might not be available to them. So that's when you have to look at W-4 adjustments and, and reducing their, their withholding from that perspective. And also then you have complications of planning for foreign tax credit purposes, um, foreign or income exclusion we talked about, and then the concept of equalization. And if you're going to equalize individuals that may have a, a rise in, in tax um, because of their assignment to a different country, or there may be a, a tax benefit that they'll receive because they're going to a no tax jurisdiction and all of a sudden they're able to, to really reduce their income. So are you going to, to tax equalize or not? in those situations and hold them only to their stay at home tax liability. Yeah, and, and I think you know broadly for a green card holder who's a resident, it's more in the nuance that we see the differences. Some tax treaties when defining a resident who is a green card holder will require that that individual meet certain additional criteria to be purposes to be resident for the purposes of the treaty. So I think there's just some nuance in there that if there is tax planning, you know, in the face of it, the individual is a resident, no difference to a citizen, but there can be some nuances in that that can have an impact. Again, some kind of nuances around green card holders overseas coming back to work in the United States, uh, resourcing of income out of the US for tax purposes. Um, so the, the, the last piece being that a green card holder can, under a treaty, file as a non-resident in the US, but that can, from an immigration perspective, jeopardize uh, their green card. So again, there's a lot that needs to be considered around some of those things, um, but it's not to say that on the, the majority of considerations as a resident kind of follow through. Uh, we did have a question, by the way, and I'll just bring that up, um, that says, what are some types of income that fall into worldwide income besides employment income? Well, it's almost, you know, whatever you can think of, um, unless there is a specific exclusion for it. So when you're looking at somebody inbound to the US, you know, it's interest, dividends, capital gains, if they have certain types of investment income um, in the US, that might be treated as what we call a passive foreign investment company. So oftentimes we'll see mutual funds, uh, unit trusts that fall into this tax regime, whereby there can be a quite punitive look back taxation and penalties. So that's where it's really, really critical for people coming into the US that you've got really effective tax planning ahead of time around non-employment income. Um, if you think about it in an outbound perspective, I think one of the important things is you may be in a country where uh, certain income isn't subject to tax. You know, it may be that you can provide assignment benefits that don't fall into tax there, but do in the US. So it's not necessarily the case that what gets reported on your W-2 equivalent in another country is what should be reported in an individual's tax return and subject to US tax. So again, it leads to complexities around that. Same on the personal income. Um, it may be that you can invest in tax efficient um, investment um, accounts in a foreign country that don't generate local taxation. Typically in the US, that won't follow here either. So. Um, you know, worldwide income really is worldwide unless there is uh, a specific exception for it. So thank you for the question. So we've got the slide up. We'll, we'll go a little bit more into the remote working, some of the questions that we got there. And so the first one was, you know, what, what is the threshold most countries are using for remote workers um, and when they become taxable as a result of remote working while sitting in that country? Well, I think there's, there's two considerations to that. The first is, what does the domestic tax law say? And then what does a bilateral agreement say? And oftentimes a country will say, well, day one, you're taxable. Uh, you're working here, you have income source of the country. And again, unless there is a specific exclusion or the law says otherwise in that country, then you're taxable from day one. The double tax treaties that we ran through before, that's where you have that 183 days. Um, and again, other considerations that you're not paid by on behalf of an employer in that country, 
um, and that you the cost of that employment are not borne by an entity that you as a company have in that foreign jurisdiction. You aren't charging their costs into into that um, into an entity there. So if they're able to meet the treaty, then potentially you've got 183 days. So that might be fiscal year, you know, so the UK's tax year ends 5th of April, Australia 30th of June. It could be calendar year, or it could be a rolling 12-month period that starts or ends in the tax year. So um, that's where the, there isn't a, a clear answer. Again, to go back to what my point on the OECD, the OECD is there to kind of give guidance, instruction, and counsel to tax authorities. It's not there to um, to bind them necessarily. And so that's where we don't have as yet any kind of harmonization that says, should there be an, a de minimis amount of time that an employee can spend in a country um, without it ultimately be, becoming subject to uh, tax? I mean, the same from a US perspective, there's still no harmonization across US states. Um, so, you know, it, it gives you a sense of the scale of the, the potential task there. In terms of, you know, best practice, there's a real range here. Now, I would say, again, from a tax perspective, the position is always that you've got to do what the law says. That's what, you know, our advice always has to be. Pragmatically, though, you know, it kind of comes down to what is the risk tolerance of a certain organization from a tax perspective? We've seen a lot of organizations kind of look at 30 days, maybe 60 days, and in some cases, even 90 days that an individual might be allowed to work remotely and the company um will be comfortable that that individual isn't accruing for themselves and the company tax risk in that jurisdiction. Now, with that, it's not just simply the days that come into play. Is there an entity in that, um, you know, do you have an entity in that foreign country? Could they work from an office? You know, are you kind of comfortable that, you know, there are um, opportunities under the treaty to put costs there and, again, mitigate some of that risk if you needed to? Um, is it a country with no tax regime? You, you know, so it may be that um, that's a consideration too. So the, the the nuance we can really go into, what is that country? Do we have a double tax treaty? Is there a bilateral social security agreement? Do we, as I say, have a presence there? Um, what is the kind of audit activity or authorities? Is it something that we think they're going to look at or not? Obviously, that then needs to tie into all those other considerations that come in. You know, what is the type of work that that individual does? Um, are they involved in sales? Are they selling in that country? Are they signing contracts, et cetera? So it, it's where the starting point on a number of days you can get comfortable with. Um, it can be kind of going down the rabbit hole in terms of, you know, all the different tax complexities. And that's where um, I think it is important to get a sense of, the number of days you're comfortable with, but also then to kind of elevate that back up to say, where are you? So again, that 30 to 90 is what we've seen quite a lot of. Um, again, but it's kind of backstopped by all those other considerations in terms of what works for a specific organization. All right, Josh. So the next question we have is, can we discuss the tax home issues that we have due to remote working? And the example was given that the person has a remote job, they live in one state and travel to an office in another state. Pre-pandemic, that job may have been located in that other state, but now they just go there periodically. Is that considered commuting? And if so, is there a way to set it up so that the travel is a business travel and not commuting? But is business travel, do we still have to deal with the 12 month away from home restrictions? So I guess kind of a lot to unpack there. Um, I guess we'll start with the the first um, concept of the tax home. So, really, what the the rules haven't been updated since um, what I in my research was since 2018. Some of the stuff was reaffirmed, and I haven't there hasn't been anything else that have come out yet. But basically, what they're saying, what the rules say, is if you're commuting from your home to your primary place of work, that is still considered commuting costs, and it's very limited to what you can deduct and, and reimburse as a business expense because the IRS does not consider commuting to be um, work. And really what the key is, is the primary place of business change? So has that individual that was tagged to a particular office and now is remote, has that job been moved to a fully remote job and that person's principal place of business is now their home? In a hybrid situation, it's really hard to argue that 
um, you know, if they're three days in the office, office and two days at home, that the primary place of business has changed, making those things very hard to say that they're business travel and not commuting. Now, if the individual, if the job spec has changed and their location, say, in their system, as now their, their primary work location is their home, there may be some argument there that those costs are not commuting and that you're actually paying them for travel outside of their primary place of business and reimbursing them for business expenses. So really, that's the way that I would I would look at that um, in terms of, you know, tax home. And it really is coming down to have you taken steps or has the employee taken steps to change their primary place of business? And has that been affirmed by the employer where oftentimes we'll find people just pick up and move to a state because they wanted to, but the job is still requiring them to be in a particular office location and the employer is not yet ready to say their principal place of business is their remote location. Yeah, and I think you've also got states to consider, like New York, that has the convenience of the employer rule, which is effectively saying that, you know, in a nutshell, if you work, if you have a, US, a, a New York employer, but you're choosing to work remotely, not for the benefit of the employer, and, and that is defined and it's quite restrictive in terms of uh, how that applies, <clears throat> then, um, you know, if your employment is through New York, then New York will seek to tax 100% of that income, irrespective of where you're working. You know, it's one of those things that we saw in the pandemic of folks going to places like Florida, where there's no income tax regime, thinking this is great, I might get out of New York tax, only to find that while they may be able to break uh, residency, um, you know, maybe for city purposes, maybe for state, their income was still sourced back to New York in full. So, um, you know, the issues around remote working in the U.S. and the tax home can kind of get compounded depending upon where the previous work location was and whether or not any travel the company pays for is commuting, as Josh said, and therefore it's a taxable benefit, um, or whether or not, you know, you're you're really getting out of the taxes that you might be looking to by working in another jurisdiction. I, I think another point just to pick up there as well is that the um, you know there are certain countries that have, sorry certain states that have reciprocity agreements, and so depending on where folks are going, depending on where you're working, it's just worth considering is there a reciprocity agreement? Where should you be get? Uh, where should the tax withholding be? Um, and what systems are in place within the the payroll systems in order to reflect that? as well. So if you're seeing employees move, it's worth considering, you know, is the home location driving the withholding? Um, or is it the work location that's driving the withholding? And again, both uh, options may be the right answer, just depending upon the state that you're looking at. Residency in some is the driver of uh, withholding. As we saw in New York, not so much it's the office location that's more the driver. And again, those are, those are important to make sure that people are getting withholding the right places. There's no unpleasant surprises as we go through. Okay, so the, the next question that we got um, is, a, is a really interesting one. And has the IRS made any comment regarding virtual assignments? And, and the, the easy answer is no. Uh, as I mentioned, no guidance from the IRS since 2020, and that was in regards to alleviating and mitigating some of the issues around um, potential taxation in the US, uh, as well as um, availability of reliefs uh, during the pandemic. I think when you start looking at virtual assignments, and certainly, you know, the the, the we've seen um, a, an increased appetite for them. Part of the risk that you have there goes back to what I shared on the on the earlier slide. If you have somebody working for the benefit, you know, in the U.S., they're working for the benefit of a foreign entity. They are directed by them. Their work is controlled by them. They're reporting into a foreign entity. The risk that potentially a virtual assignment brings is that somebody is working for a different entity that isn't necessarily registered in the country they're working. So does that individual on a virtual assignment create a permanent establishment or a corporate taxable presence for the entity that they're working for? Um, so in, in actual fact, virtual assignments may practically make a lot of sense. You know, we're all, um, you know, virtual today. I'm sure many of you are working from home. I'm sure, you know, all of us are going to be at some point working with colleagues and other folks, maybe vendors in countries other than the one that we're sitting in. 
um, from an internal assignment perspective, that can create issues that a virtual assignment could create corporate exposure, um, as well as withholding obligations for that foreign entity. Not to say it's insurmountable, um, but again, it's something that needs to be considered in those types of programs because there is just that risk um, that they uh, that they get tripped up. Okay. And then the last one we had around the, the remote work is just, are we expecting to see changes in the new year? Um, I mean, it's a bit of a crystal ball question, and I would probably use it for sports results if I had a crystal ball as opposed to uh, tax law changes. But I, I think, I mean, again, if you if you if you look into where things are at the moment and what we're seeing, again, the OECD has taken an awfully long time. They've not even indicated if um, they will even take on this remote work, tax considerations, advice to tax authorities. So again, nothing clear there. Um, and while they've encouraged there to be collaboration, you know, I've not seen anything significant yet. So I would say no as yet. And again, I think it's fair to say that a lot of the rules in place internationally between countries that are there to mitigate taxation issues, social security, really just don't fit the new types of mobility that we have. You know, case in point is the Social Security Administration in the US um, for, for, for certificate of coverage applications where you're looking to keep somebody in the US uh, Social Security regime as opposed to one overseas while they work remotely. Those bilateral agreements re relate to people who are posted to work overseas where you're sending them. Again, traditional mobility. The, the employer is requiring it and where they're not, um, we've seen applications get denied. And so part of the risk there, again, um, is how does that get managed? You know, will there be some indicative guidance? But as yet, uh, again, we've seen a more strict application of the rules as drafted, um, as opposed to accommodations for the way in which people are choosing to work now. Okay. Flip to the next slide. We're going to turn next to business travel, remounts of business travel. Um, so I guess, Josh, do you may want to kick things off with the, the first question on that? Sure. So the, this next question, um, you know, asks how companies are treating thresholds for frequent business travelers, especially those coming to the U.S. before remitting taxes to the U.S. government on their behalf. And, and I guess this kind of ties back into some of those discussions that we had um, a little bit ago on remote working and the thresholds that companies are placing on their individuals um, for withholding and reporting instances. Those same type of thought process should be done for business travel. And really where we've seen a lot of success with our clients in using this is making that determination and setting up that risk profile, understanding which employees are coming into the US, what their purpose for business is in here in the US and the amount of time they're spending. So there may not be a, a one size fit all answer here, as you may have a group of executives that are triggering a threshold much faster or than you know, a group of regular employees by virtue of um, cross charges back to the US entity for a global tax roll, which would you know invalidate the treaty, causing them to have withholding very early on in their US uh, travel. You've also got to, to contend with the the risk that those individuals may place by virtue of them being here. So you've got to consider the P issues that we had mentioned a, a few times. So I'm thinking about an executive class that might be causing some different issues than some of your other employees. If you've got individuals that are executing contracts or, or sales, those people should be reviewed very closely. So really what we've seen is a bifurcation of employee by role and level and then by um, potentially country that they're coming from so that we can look at the network of tax treaties that allow people to be in the U.S. And then from there, looking at if the expenses are being cross-charged back into the U.S., making kind of different risk assessments based on those individuals to make sure that they're, you're meeting the requirements as an employer, and then also that the employee is meeting their requirements from an individual tax standpoint. So, there are particular exemptions that could, you could benefit from the withholding perspective. If you think about the way that Canada US tax treaty is structured, there's a $10,000 exemption of withholding for, for those individuals. 
for non-resident individuals that that could be up to three thousand of earned income in the U.S. that you may not have to file um, withholding requirements there. You know, the other thing to consider is when you do have individuals that are coming from a treaty country and they do meet the treaty obligations, that doesn't mean your compliance obligations cease to exist just because there's no income tax. There still would be a requirement for the, the company to collect um, W-8 forms so that the company has a certification from the individual that they are meeting the tax treaty and the benefits do apply then the company would still have a requirement to issue a 1042S detailing out the exempt income that the individual received um, based on virtue of the treaty article that they're using. And then the individual actually does have a filing requirement to report as a non-resident the treaty exemption that they're claiming and, and reporting that income that was reported in the 1042 as exempt. So the um, IRS knows that you're claiming the treaty exemption. As I also had mentioned earlier, not all states follow income tax treaty so you could run into a situation where you have business travel into california into kentucky those are two that i see quite frequently that they do not actually follow income tax treaties so even though they may be exempt from irs and federal tax they still would be subject in this case to california or kentucky tax which makes this a very difficult thing to administer from a payroll perspective then of course you've got the social tax issues that we had highlighted earlier are they coming from a country that has a bilateral agreement with the us and are you able to exempt some social tax there otherwise you would have some social tax things to contend with also and i think it's fair to say the, the us isn't unique in in that you know the date going back to the question you know the days threshold um you know it as just it applies to taxation you've got the treaties to benefit from but also the consideration of you know how are you going to approach and require compliance at an individual level. Same applies in India, for example, to avail of the short stay exemption as they refer to under the treaty. Um, from, again, from a US perspective, when you look out internationally, in the UK, the short term business visitor agreement allows for a company to assert that an employee is resident, that they meet the criteria under a tax treaty to not be subject to tax. In the US, an employer can't make that assertion, and so hence the need to do the the, the tax filing. So I think, you know, that is a um, a challenge. Again, no indications currently that that's going to be um, that's going to go away. And you know, if you if you look at the large business and international teams uh, list of compliance focus areas for quite a number of years, 1042s compliance, this has been a focus on that. Um, as something as you know needing greater education for employers and, and looking at compliance so you know whether or not we see any change is a bit of a again it's one of those crystal balls again so thank you for that question uh, we'll quickly just go back actually just to a couple of questions that we've had come through in the chat just going back to the remote work and the first one uh, I, I did touch on a little bit asked does an employer of record mitigate any of the corporate tax risk or merely social security and employment taxes um, that's going to depend on the country. If you go to, say, the Netherlands or China, the answer is most likely no. Um, the, the tax authorities would look at who is this individual, who are they ultimately working for, what benefit um, are they ultimately deriving and potentially assess permanent establishment, you know, corporate tax exposure on the, employ the, the deemed employing company um, that's overseas. So in, in some instances, yes, you know, that's OK. In others, uh, technically, no. Obviously, you've got the consideration around what is the likelihood of enforcement around uh, and the jurisdiction to enforce that with a foreign country company that, that doesn't have a presence. But I think it it is important that if you're going into a country and you're going through an employer of record, uh, you know, a, a, or a PEO, that um, if there is an expectation that you may scale in that country, it's really important to do it right at the outset and not to create any kind of trailing risk and liability exposure by having used the employee of record. So certainly um, worth reviewing. Again, certain countries like Spain, there can be broader labor law issues that certainly sit outside of our remit, um, but need to be considered as well. Um, the other question that we had uh, ties back to some of the state considerations that Josh touched on, just asking you know, if we have state people working in states where we don't have an entity, are we required to operate payroll withholding, enroll them in state and employment, et cetera? Um, I don't know if you want to touch on that, 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So you know, I think the requirements would come back to a few things: how the state is perceiving income tax withholding. So, like Richard was talking about a little bit ago on reciprocity agreements, do you have a requirement to withhold based on that reciprocal agreement if one exists? If it doesn't exist and the individual is performing services in that state and it would be considered taxable there, then you likely would have a withholding requirement, which would then cause you to have registration issues. Um, if that person is primarily working from there, it also could potentially be some unemployment or disability insurance that you have to register and withhold on. So it, it does kind of make it complicated if you have remote workers operating in a state that you don't have operations in. And if their primary work location is in a different state um, and there's no reciprocal agreements, that could cause issues. And you've also got to consider the, the state nexus and corporate tax issues. Um, for in, employees, having employees in a particular state may cause nexus, which would then cause you to have corporate tax implications where you may have to apportion income to that state which can be particularly challenging if you were benefiting from some of those exemptions that were provided where you weren't necessarily operating in, but you're generating income. If people are now working in that state, you may lose some of those exemptions that you had on those nexus issues, which would then apportion maybe an inequitable amount of income to that state based on the amount of employees that you have there. So it's really um, tricky to, to have people in states that you're not operating in and making sure that you're really doing a thorough review of the withholding and then potentially the, the nexus issues and then the registration issues that you may have. Okay. So we'll move to our third topic. We're pivoting somewhat away from that and going more into the kind of the traditional mobility considerations. We were asked a couple of questions around compensation challenges, and we're going to focus at least for this discussion more around equity-based compensation because Obviously, this is a real challenge, whether it's someone going on an assignment, a transfer. It's an area that we have seen and continue to see be a real um, a real challenge for employers to manage. From the perspective of tracking, from the perspective of understanding what gets taxed where, do treaties come into play? And as Josh talked about earlier, the fact that um, countries will have different approaches as to how they deem the income to be sourced. So is it just simply based on the time they spend working in a country or maybe some other measure in terms of uh, attributing income to a country? So the question that we were asked was, what is the best practice for handling equity as part of a global compensation reporting for assignees? So I think the first point here is um, to, to understand internationally how your plans are taxed. Now, it may be that, you know, a lot of plans are drafted in a relatively standard way with RSUs and other um, types of equity vehicles that you might want to use. Um, but the, the key thing is that there can be real, again, nuances on a country to country basis based upon whether costs are recharged, um, based on you know, stock options, the, the exercise period. Um, and so it is important to firstly understand what are your obligations in country, particularly as it relates to someone coming into that country who may have participated in a plan where the rules in the country they're coming from don't match up specifically to the ones where they've gone. So again, understanding what it is that you've got to do and what those obligations are at, at a first point of principle is, is absolutely critical rather than making you know, assumptions around that. I think the second piece then is, is the tracking. Um, you know, the tracking is is absolutely key. Do you know where your employees have been? You know, if you had somebody who was on an assignment in another country seven years ago, eight years ago, that has stock options that they still not exercised, but may be sourced and taxable in the country that they were on assignment in, do you know where those people are? Do you know where they've been in the interim? Um and therefore, are they on the radar for the purposes of uh, allocating that, that taxation correctly? So, you know, I think those two principles are absolutely key. Now, obviously, technology plays a part here in order to, um, you know, to, to get that tracking, to get that visibility. This is something that, you know, in my view as a, as a tax consultant, you know, it, it's somewhat incumbent on vendors and the relationship that you have to provide those solutions around, well, how do you keep this 
visible? How do you uh, keep abreast of, of what, what it is that you need to do? And again, if you're using an employer of record, a PEO, and you do have people in, in those organizations that are participants in your share plan, understanding the compliance obligations around people that sit somewhat outside of the organization. Um, so again, I think those are the real key things. Uh, the, the other piece then, you know, as I mentioned in, in the first part, is, is just how does a country source it? Singapore, as many of you will know, if you are awarded stock while you're there and then the individual leaves, it may be subject to a deemed exercise. So it's deemed to uh, all become taxable 30 days prior to departure from Singapore. And it may well be that the country that they move to, and if that is the US, there's no tax treaty the US at the point of the actual vesting or exercise will tax 100% of it. So it can lead to situations of double taxation. A lot of countries also just do not have clear rules around this. Um, and so it may be that it's in case law, it may be that it's in kind of non-binding guidance issued by a tax authority. And so again, you know, Israel is another country that you know I've been supporting some clients with recently and real challenges there in the need to get prayer rulings from the tax authorities if you want something definitive that says well is a vesting for someone who goes into israel from the us is it taxable in full there is it apportioned um do you do it on a source basis based on where people have worked so those are the types of issues that come out of an equity program that need to be addressed and tackled head on and ideally done well in advance so it's not you know a kind of a scramble at the point at which uh, these situations arise. Obviously, that's a perfect state. Perfect doesn't always come into into the real world. A another question that we got um, is just how is hypo tax on equity best handled for tax equalized employees? Josh, when you pick that one up. Yeah. So again, it kind of comes back to what are the withholding requirements by law in that particular country where you may be wanting to enact hypothetical tax, and then balancing that with a practical application of cash flow management. So in our you know, perspective, if, as long as the, the soft payroll software allows it and that the technical risk is a, a, a reasonably reviewed, hypothetical tax on income that is sourced outside of the US, um, that would be still taxable here on a you know, hypothetical basis, would be best suited to be withheld if you can do it because it, it does manage your cash flow a lot better. Now, recognizing that there's a lot of challenges with enacting that where some of the the plan administrators and the payroll software doesn't necessarily allow for bifurcation of hypothetical versus actual withholding and you may be tied into particular statutory withholding rates based on the local jurisdictions or you know the jurisdiction that you're in it may not be really feasible to do it all the time so that's where you really then have to work with the employee to help them understand and manage their cash flow a bit so they may know that there's limitations in, in the system that um, may not allow for that. And you're you know, helping them through that could be some large swings in cash at the end when the return is filed. So it's really balancing that practical approach with what is allowable in your system. And then what, you know, how much effort will it undertake to implement something of a change with hypothetical withholding. And then comes down to employee communication so they understand their position after a big transaction. The last thing you want to do is have them do a, a lot of sell the cover when they may not need to and force them into positions that are not financially advantageous for them just to cover some tax withholding. Okay. Um, so with some of the time left, we're going to just pivot um, just a little bit to the role of, of technology. And we, we got a couple of questions around this, but I think it's, um, you know, it's certainly something that we've seen, um, you know, it's a long established desire from the companies that we work with to have uh, technology play a role um, in the management of programs. And I think obviously as technology becomes more sophisticated, so too the expectations of companies in terms of what role it can and, and should play. I think those expectations that have become um, higher, you know, I, th I think it's fair for, for companies to have a, a degree of expectation that working with different vendors, there can be integrations, automations, um, and that we can, um, you know, work across the scope of mobility taxes in order to give companies the assurance that they need around all aspects of, of compliance. Um, again, it, it can be surprising to me the, the, 
the the gaps in in oversight and um and management that, that may exist around certain aspects, particularly on the compensation side with payroll and shadow payroll. So again, big focus for us has been to, to make sure that, you know, technology can, um, you know, plug those gaps, provide the backbone to mobility programs, as well as automating processes between vendors. I think, you know, it's not, the expectation should never be that, you know, you as professionals, uh, in global mobility that you have to initiate services through multiple vendors that you have to manage those relationships and understand who has what data um, where data is relevant to more than one vendor are they sharing that with enough visibility and an understanding of roles and i think technology can do all of all of that the other, other area as well is obviously now with remote work again i think there's a couple of considerations there again, tying back to business travel as well, is where are your people? Um, do you know where your people are traveling to? Do you know where they're working? Um, you ultimately will have the data available, anyone accessing a network, accessing a um, via a VPN, you're going to have data in terms of where they are that can be leveraged for tax purposes. Now, it's not to say you're spying on anybody. That's certainly not what we want to do. But again, I think it's leveraging data that's available to make sure that, you know, you are being compliant. Again, goes back to that uh, point I raised earlier. Well, whose obligation is it to make sure that, um, you know, you're compliant in a foreign jurisdiction? Well, often it is yours as the employing company to make sure that you're compliant. So again, using data that is available to you to meet those uh, obligations. The other consideration that arose coming out of the pandemic, and as we saw this increase in international remote work, was just around approvals. You know, as we said, the tax is only one component part, uh, though obviously we see it as a very important part. Um, it's just one component part of how um, remote work arrangements, you know, um, can be assessed in terms of whether or not they're viable, you know, whether it's IT security, uh, whether it's a viability, you know, a business continuity, is it, is it feasible for this person to be working in a different time zone? All those other considerations and sign-offs, again, they can be automated, routed, et cetera, assessed up front. So again, I think it's looking to technology to, to, to take away some of the pain points that may have existed historically and to look at how they can be streamlined to drive compliance, to do it on a bespoke basis specific to your organization. Because like we said, you know, um, the, the way in which you're approaching your global workforce, the way that you're managing it, the tax risks that exist within your business are different from the next. And so again, I think that's where technology plays a really key role in, um, in taking away some of the pressures and the strains and the administration. You don't need to necessarily hire more people when you can uh, just have better data that you can act upon. Okay, so mindful of, um, of time. Um, the last questions that we got were around mobility program uh, management. And so this was more specific to, you know, how do we do what we do? Um, and how do we work with companies like yours? So some perspectives on that from a U.S. management perspective. First question asked, you know, do most of our clients have a program structure set up as one of our offices being the central point of coordination and that we uh, centrally coordinate everything, communications, et cetera, with other global uh, offices? So, Josh, why don't you take that one? Yeah, so we would, we would recommend that that's how – most uh, arrangements are set up. Obviously, that makes it a lot easier from uh, your management perspective. You're not having to remember or find 40, 20, 30 different contacts in the different GTI offices or the, the different Grant Thornton International offices around the world. You rely on us to do that. And then it also allows us to synthesize and provide some pragmatic advice where if we're not able to understand what the foreign country is providing on tax advice, we're being that first stopper. We're reviewing it, understanding it, and then making it practical for you to, to implement with the considerations of your program. Now, obviously that allow, 
uh, allows for a lot more work on our side to be more coordinated as a, a providing team, making sure that all of our offices understand your program and your policies and the way in which we work with you. But that's incumbent on any really good provider to to make sure that we're all working in the same way and, and providing the advice the same way. But the other benefit there is it allows us to have um, as a central office to have oversight of the whole program. So we understand, you know, what your key strategies may be in Asia Pacific versus the MEA versus the US and tying that all into one really cohesive service. We find that that's the best uh, answer to manage most programs. Yeah, and I'd add that, you know, I think this is where it's important that it doesn't preclude the local to local contact. You know, if you need a payroll advisor in the country that your expats are working, then they should, you know, it may be that having that that, in, that contact between um, your provider's team and um, your local team makes an awful lot of sense. But again, I think it's important to keep that visibility and transparency to make sure um, that your vendor has eyes on everything. And obviously a lot of it will come back to approvals of out of scope fees, which I'm sure you're all, familiar with and, and and have had dealings with. Again, it's making sure that you've got transparency around what's happening so there's no surprises as well. And that ties to the, the probably the last question that we'll cover off uh, today, um, which do you recommend your clients set up a billing structure as a la carte or bundle pricing for tax services? Um, you know, again, I think not to, um, to give a non-answer, but it really depends on the program and it depends on the company. Um, there's a there's a, a pleasant simplicity in the billing, you know, and the budgeting. Um, if you have bundled fees, you know, you know, with a more, with a higher degree of certainty what your cost will be and the potential to mitigate out of scope. Um, at the same time, obviously, when you're bundling fees, and depending on what, it, what is in that bundle, there's a queer, you know, question as to, well, how is that bundle and the numbers arrived at? And, and are you theoretically incurring costs that on an a la carte basis, you may not need to. So, again, I think, you know, it depends on program size. If it's a smaller program, then the a la carte may work really effectively, allows you to track costs, allows you to identify individuals who are going to incur higher levels of compliance fees and possible as a scope. Um, and those that are quite simple to have a lower level of cost associated with them. Uh, so, you know, I, I think there isn't necessarily a, a single one size fits all, but it's something that needs to be weighed up, um, you know, internally. I think it also needs to be weighed up with the vendor as well. You, you know, typically, if you're looking at re-engaging, you know, on an SOW on an annual basis or uh, another periodic interval, uh, those are the types of conversations that, that should be on the table in terms of how you manage things and how you want things to work going uh, going forwards. Thank you both. That was fascinating. I have learned an awful lot myself. Um, it's like a, a whirlwind tour into US tax. So thank you. Um, yeah, so much knowledge to unpack. Um, we have got quite a lot of questions, actually, that we haven't had time to get round to answering. So we will keep them all ready for our J workshop on US tax. I just want to invite you both just to Give us a quick sum up. Any final thoughts, closing comments um, in your last sort of five minutes? Yeah, I mean, I, I think from my perspective that it's a really exciting time in global mobility. You know, the industry itself is changing in terms of what the tax firms are doing with some of the changes and the split outs there. That changes the market. Um, it changes the services, the service delivery model. Um, and again, I think as you know, buyers of those services, it allows you the opportunity to look at, well, what is it that we want out of our service provider? What is it that our population of employees want? What is the experience that you're going to get and the experience that your uh, employees are going to get? So I think just as an industry perspective, it's a really unique time consolidation as well on, uh, you know, within some of the RMCs to uh, and new technologies coming to the fore, different vendors there providing some really interesting and in innovative solutions that yeah, allow you to reimagine how your program should operate um, as well and what your role is and the role of your team. Um, at, at the same time, you know, going back to the um, earlier slide that just shows the way that things are changing, uh, I think obviously it puts a um, potentially a huge amount on your plate. And part of it is, you know, whose plate should it actually sit on? I think, you know, 
oftentimes we would see that business travel was a bit of a a bit of a hot potato in terms of you know who should look after it. Um, I think we've got a lot more of those now with uh, the way that businesses, uh, the way that workforces are being managed. And with that, you know, there's a real need to be very integrated with your tax teams, your finance teams, um, obviously benefits, payroll, et cetera, that you, you may be uh, closer to or, already as well. But again, I think it's a it's very much a shared effort and having the clarity and roles and responsibilities, um, the approval processes, et cetera allows you to to move forward you know in a really compliant way but again you know we see an awful lot around um the global workforce the role of the chro um and the fact that this is a board issue um you know again i think when you look at it in the context of mobility it's funny to see the um interest in global mobility at the moment within organizations within you know the business media industry media um, perhaps in a way that wasn't there in a pre-pandemic way it was perhaps more niche and uh, and really it's one of those issues that it's the forefront of business planning so you know I, again i think as mobility professionals it provides the ability to be at the forefront of you know how a business operates it's a really really strategic role i think you know, it obviously always was but i do think that you know with the shifts in industry with the uh the changes in global workforces you know mobility professionals and your vendors you know the roles that we all have are um increasingly important in terms of the success of a business and so you know your expectations should be commensurate to that as well josh yeah i think uh, i think to really just to summarize the discussion today is you know mobility tax in particular it is much more than what most people think of just traditional expats and income tax and payroll you know we spent you know very small proportionate amount of time discussing those issues and there's a far greater um, discussion that needs to happen and an understanding that needs to happen, which I'm sure most of you do by based on the questions, but just getting others to understand that it, it does touch state nexus and it, it can touch PE and it can touch corporate risk. And obviously you've got, like Richard was saying, immigration and employment labor law and equity and all these different things that impact mobility that when most people think about it in the you know very narrow scope of expats and payroll, you know, you're missing the really big picture on all these different implications that be, could be causing your organization or your, your business that may be being missed out right now. Excellent. Um, Josh, Richard, thank you. We just want to thank you all for joining us for what's been our first GMJ workshop um, and the first on US tax. So hopefully the first of many. So just for today from Andy and I, and of course from Richard Tong and Josh Jagust, our expert speakers from Grant Thornton, um, and all of our ambassadors here today and our HR mobility guests, thank you all so much. Um, it's been great to see you all and we hope to see you again. Um, Richard, Josh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you.